chair of the board of members of our attendance. Okay, we have one very special uh, announcement I would like to begin tonight with. Um, I'm going to ask Mr. McGinnis if you could kindly stand up and join me up here along with uh, Ms. Dankinell and Dr. Romanelli. As Mr. McGinnis has decided to retire after nine fabulous years of leadership. special guests in the audience as well. So once again, good evening everybody. Uh, thank you for taking the opportunity. Uh, thank you for allowing me to take the opportunity to speak about Mr. Ron McGinnis, member of school board who is retiring after nine years of dedicated service. And also, 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> after 12 years. I think that was pretty good. I also want to, I do want to acknowledge as well. Yeah, where are you? Thank you. Some things about Ron that you don't know. For example, 
Maybe you aren't aware that Ron and his wife Gail convinced the West Islip Soccer Club to form the High Flyer Soccer League for Children with Special Needs in 2003. And together, Ron and Gail have won the league for the past 20 years. You might not know that between baseball, basketball, and soccer, Ron has also coached youth athletics for around those same 20 years. Another thing you might not know about Ron is that he has volunteered his time at every West Islip Soccer Club tournament for decades. Actually, that one you might know because he might have sold you snacks in between your kids' games. Mostly, you might not know that Ron has served this community as a Board of Education member for the past 12 years providing a consistent voice of reason for fiscal responsibility, educational excellence, and fairness for all our children. During that time, Ron helped guide our school community through the Great Recession, consolidation of buildings, redistricting, and COVID. And we emerged from each of these crises stronger than we were before. Despite financial hardships during and after that recession, the district completely overhauled security improved infrastructure, and added new and exciting programs. Ron was a significant force behind all of that. Before I conclude, and I'm sure Ron is counting the seconds, I also want to acknowledge the sacrifice made by Ron's family, Gail, Sean, Erica, and Kimberly. Thank you for sharing Ron with the community. I know he was missed at home, but West Islip is better for his efforts. Erica, I'm also sorry for all the times we had meetings during Islanders and Mets games. <laughs> Believe me, there were plenty of times I heard that she was mad at me about that. Ron, on behalf of Amory, Kevin, all the board members that you've ever served with, all the board members that before you served, and all the kids who you worked so hard for, it was our privilege to serve all those years with you and I want to thank you for always being prepared, always being professional, and most of all, always putting the kids first.
you know, COVID hit and that had its different challenges, but you know, full drive, you know, myself as well as every other board member that I've served with has always had um, what we feel is the best interest of the kids in mind. So I just want to thank the community for their support, to thank the board of boards for, for everything over the past couple of years, and, and most importantly, I want to thank my family, especially my wife, Gail. Um, they put up with a lot for 12 years. I've missed a lot of dinners, missed a lot of, uh, of things, because uh, you spend a lot of time on the board. And um, so I truly appreciate everything that they've done, so I couldn't have done without them. Thank you. That was so nice, I'd like to adjourn and then a good work. <laughs> so uh, I know getting back to business, Dr. Romelli uh, has had some announcements he would like to make about school safety. Dr. Romelli? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Tussie. Um, congratulations, we guess. Uh, we have uh, been talking about school safety as a big topic over the past few budget presentations, uh, Board of Education meetings. Uh, if you haven't been able to see any of those presentations, they are recorded and online, and you can access them on our website. Um, so I won't you know, go through all of that, but we did hear from the community that this is an issue that we want to keep at the forefront and really be talking at board meetings moving forward. Uh, you know, there was some, some sentiment shared that you know this is one of those things where we have a tragic event in the country and people come out and express outrage and talk about change and then it kind of fades away until the next time. I know that we've all experienced things like that uh, and seen that happen before. So uh, what we are going to do and we're committed to do is really just giving updates to the public. Um, you know, our uh, administrative team, also uh, Mr. McAlevey, uh, our school safety director, uh, been collecting data that we will share you know, with the public and with our Board of Education to make an important decision on this topic. And that's exactly the phase that we are still in right now. Uh, this is a really important decision, and uh, we are in really the data collection phase and reporting and considering uh, all the data we have. So I'll just share a little bit about where we are at right now, um, because last time we met, we talked about maybe bringing back some specifics as to if we implemented our guards in the school district, what would that look like uh, in West Islip? Because there are many different models out there across the country regarding armed guards. You know, there are the models all the way from uh, you know hiring an outside company to come in uh, there and having an outside company run the whole operation and really be almost separate from the school district. You know, stay outside the buildings. Um, you know, some districts set up a quarter body outside. They don't even come inside the buildings at all. Um, there's also, and then there's the thought about, is it at one building? Is it at all buildings? Is it a couple people around town? Um, there's also the other end of that, which is have your own security team within the district that's employed by the district. Um, and, you know, we have our own security team here in West Isa. They are excellent. Uh, just some stats about that. Uh, if, we did this, if we did decide to proceed, um, really the the data and the recommendations that we are seeing and the recommendations from our own security team are about utilizing our existing security team. Um, one of the big things about our security team currently is that we have about 90% of our security team is retired law enforcement officers. We have about 80% of our team already with their armed guard licenses. Uh, so that's a pretty special uh, situation to be in when making a decision like this. Uh, you know, we have uh, three of our, our member of our 43 member team that are actually active police officers currently. Um, so it's a, a very seasoned group of people. Uh, just some stats just to consider as well. Um, our current pay for our school safety officers is $20.33 an hour. A school safety officer with law enforcement or district experience gets $23.73 an hour. If we were to do an armed guard differential and looking at the models that other districts have used, it's about an additional $10 per hour per guard, uh, which equals out to be about $33.73 an hour for an armed guard. Um, of course, these are approximate numbers. I mean, they're pretty precise, but you know things can change with them uh, over the course of time. Uh, if we did implement a model like this, you know, this is something that we would really like to see. Uh, at least one person at each of our buildings. Uh, the data is just telling us that, you know, having just one person in the district or having people, you know, spread out doesn't necessarily eliminate the wait time that you experience from waiting for law enforcement. That's not a knock at law enforcement at all. I just want to be clear about that. It takes time for 
law enforcement to get to the premises. Um, we have a great partnership with Suffolk County Police Department. Uh, Mr. McAlevey was kind enough to arrange uh, you know, a visit from Deputy Commissioner Carter at our last meeting. It was great to have him here. We're in constant communication with them uh, and keeping up to date there. So that is actually a differential um, if you looked at what we have now currently and if we went to armed guards of just under $100,000 um, in terms of salary there, so in terms of payment. Um, so that would be the difference there. There are, of course, other additional costs considered there, which are a New York State Armed Guard license renewal, which is a few hundred dollars a year. Uh, we would want people to undergo psychological exams. There are potential insurance costs and things like that. We would, of course, not just appoint, uh, if this was the direction that the board wanted to go in, uh, we would look to do a full hiring process where we posted for these positions. Uh, we went through an interview process. We would set some minimum requirements like seven years law enforcement experience um, and would want to really have a clear process of what we were looking for for the perfect person to be in these types of roles. Um, you know, the other big topic we've been talking about is the big, the big one is for districts that do decide to take the direction of going in the direction of, of having armed guards in the district is whether you have the armed guards be completely outside the building or, or be inside the building or be a combination of both. A lot of the data that we are seeing when we're talking to law enforcement and other districts is that um, the strictly outside of the building model is somewhat problematic, um, especially when districts announce, um, you know, we have armed guards, but they're going to stay outside the building, you know, they're not going to be in the buildings and things like that. It creates, um, you know, a challenging situation there. So. Uh, we also, with that being said, that's the type of example that uh, we would be really careful about announcing specifics of our armed guards because it ensures the safety of the school district. To not give too many details about what's going on, really more talking about how many people that we're using, you know, whether we have people in every building or things like that, but not necessarily talking about the location of people or where things are stored or anything along those lines. Um, so that would be something, again, we would share data with the Board of Education uh, to make a final decision. And, um, you know, really the interesting, another interesting point is that, uh, you know, we have three current active police officers uh, on our staff, so if there was a desire to move quicker um, in the process, you know, there is, those officers have the ability to um, carry an off-duty firearm while working in the district really at any uh, time. You know, so that's like the, the quickest moving way to do things. Um, but of course, this is a complex issue. So what we are doing right now is we are presenting data, we're talking to other districts. Um, we've seen districts that we feel have uh, very good models in place. Um, you know, we talked uh, recently to uh, East Islip, uh, who has an armed guard model in place, and uh, the superintendent shared with me that they received a number of phone calls uh, after the last school shooting uh, from community members saying, we need to get armed guards, we need to get armed guards, and they've had armed guards there for a number of years. So they've implemented the program in a way that it's not like a big fanfare type situation, uh, but they have their, their armed guards in the school with concealed weapons, um, you know, in the district, I should say, with concealed weapons, and it doesn't take away from the day-to-day -day operations that they have. Uh, one of our big concerns also was, if you see our security team, they have a connection in our buildings. You know, if you go to our buildings and you see our security guards, uh, they're working with the students, they're working with the staff, there's a relationship built there. Um, so we don't want to, uh, with any plan that we put forward, we don't want to jeopardize that um, either. And I just want to say that, you know, I have the um, utmost confidence in Mr. McAlevey that if this was a direction that we were eventually to go in, or if this was something that the Board of Education wanted to pursue, um, I do have, I, I treat everything by the bar of, you know, my own children, and you know, for the educational program and also for, you know, the safety piece, and uh, we're in really good hands with Sean. I just appreciate all the work that he's been doing. So, and you're here tonight, Sean. Thank you very much for playing. Thank you. So that's really the update. I know we don't have um, questions planned until after our, uh, our solar report, but um, I don't know if, uh, if I don't have anything else to add. Well, I'm not making a joke when I tell you that was an abbreviated version of the data that they are collecting. Uh, and I really need to say thank you to Dr. Romanelli and everyone else that's been putting all the work in here uh, into this. 
Uh, as we said months ago, we, even last year, that this is not a decision that we take lightly and we will not make a decision until we feel we have gathered all the appropriate data that we can make the best decision uh, for everyone. And that's clearly what's going on. So I, I thank you again for our time. At this time, I would like to uh, invite anyone up from the public who would like to speak on the agenda item. We have a uh, next item is a presentation from Noresco Solar. We can uh, can you come on up. Thank you. <laughs> so we have Noresco Energy. Uh, EPC uh, company. They're going to be presenting, it's actually his name is J.C. Kane, and he's going to present about the solar panel project that we completed over the last year, or a year and a half. Um, we completed this project at seven schools, the high school, two middle schools, and four elementaries. So I'll meet with J.C. I'm going to work the uh, slide down. Thank you, James. I'm happy to provide an overview of the solar project that Noresco implemented for West Islip School District and the benefits about that project. A little bit about Noresco, we're a company that's completely focused on energy projects. We've been doing this for 40 years. We've done about 5 billion in guaranteed energy projects, over 10,000 facilities, and we're a part of the Carrier Global Company. Next slide. This is a picture of uh, Aquanock Elementary School. And as James said, we did um, solar installations on all seven schools. And the cumulative effect of that is it uh, produces about 90% 90, 90 of the baseline of the electric use of those seven buildings. And it has a cost savings of about 67% of you know, the electric for those buildings. These systems were designed to meet SED so that the district would uh, qualify for building aid. It does not eliminate your electric bills, but it substantially reduces them. The other thing I'd say is when we started this project, it was at the uh, heavy point of COVID-19. And since then, the utility rates are even more volatile, which West Islip is shielded against. Next slide. There were really some very good things that happened at the time of this project. Um, first was the project was preceded by multiple roof improvement projects, which uh, made the economics better and helped it qualify for SED. The other thing is interest rates for this project that West Isaac qualified were 1.55, which is actually quite amazing. Uh, recently, we put a project at Island Park Schools in Nassau County, and the rate is just under 4%. So really, it was a historic interest rate for that. Um, the other thing is, based on West Islip's um, building aid, the reimbursement there is $5 million for the project. So it goes from a 17.9 year payback to a 5.6 year payback. Um, which is extremely significant as well. Next slide. And in addition to the benefits directly to the West Islip School District and the community, it also impacts the environment in a very positive way. So the electricity that's um, produced locally with the solar panels on the roofs has a um, equivalent greenhouse gas savings of 600 cars driven for one year, or uh, 524 homes, electricity used for an entire year, or 116,000 trash bags in the landfill. So there's also a benefit to the environment. The next slide. And, and as I mentioned, when this project started, it was right at the height of COVID-19. The other thing I'd say is, Noresco uses mostly local subcontractors, like Cell Nation, which is a company located in Ronkonkoma, New York. And we've worked with them on projects in Nassau and Suffolk County. 
COVID-19 negatively impacted many businesses, including this company. And the project here at West Islip provided a source of work for their employees and allowed the team to hire back those who had temporarily lost their jobs due to the pandemic. Um, the school district solar installations helped lay a foundation for a greener future for the next generation while being a source of positivity for the district's neighbors, their families at a difficult time. So I would definitely say it was a win-win situation. Any, any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Can I have a motion, please, needed to approve the minutes of the April 19th, 2023 regular meeting and the April 19th, 2023 budget adoption? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries. All right, we have a, a few other recognitions tonight. Uh, I'm going to again turn the microphone over to Dr. Romanelli. Hey, thank you, Mr. Tussie. Certificates over here we'll be handing out in a moment. Uh, I just wanted to actually uh, read a few of these out. Uh, we have first on our agenda this evening, we have WIASA, our administer West Side Association of School Administrators. Just wanted to say a few words just before presenting this certificate um, to I see uh, Mr. Andrew Farrell out there, Mr. Eric Allbinder, uh, just who we'll, we'll call to accept in a moment. But I just want to say that um, upon my time arriving in the district, I have just been continually impressed by our administrators across the district. Uh, they are dedicated, they are leaders that put students first. Uh, we've had some great discussions about the future of schools this year, and I could not be prouder to be working with our administrative team uh, to be moving in that direction because there's really some forward thinking people, and again, people that are dedicated to uh, putting students first. I've just been so impressed by really the pride and love for West Islip that our administrators have for their buildings, for the community, for their departments. Uh, it truly is uh, incredible. And our administrators are crucial to the success of our schools and our students. Um, they, so we, they celebrate student achievements every day. They promote a high culture of expectations uh, across our district and in our buildings. And a lot of our success uh, in the district comes from our work and dedication. So our first recognition tonight, we'd like to call up uh, Mr. Andrew O'Farrell and Mr. Eric Goldwinder to collect this certificate. Our second group out of our five groups this evening, we have our information technology department, otherwise known as our IT department. Um, I see that we have Dr. Kylie Rendon here to accept uh, on behalf of this group. So, you know, they say that the sign of a good IT department is that uh, everything is running so smoothly that you don't even know that they exist. And uh, our IT department, I would liken to uh, ninjas in that way, where uh, sometimes they are in. Uh, before people arrive, uh, they're here later uh, after everyone goes home, and just ensuring the smooth success of our school district. Everything uh, is in beds IT nowadays. Um, you know, we have an upcoming uh, election, and we have a budget vote next week. You know, IT is a crucial part of that uh, as well. So everything that we do uh, involves IT nowadays, and we could not be successful as a school district without their work. Um, I should also note that we have been operating our technology department. Um, without a director, and a lot of people have really stepped up and made sure that our district 
uh, has run smoothly over the past few months, and I cannot thank them enough for that. Uh, on the instructional side of things, uh, we have uh, we have computer TAs. I see some here this evening. We have uh, tech integration specialists, and just talking about infusing technology in our classrooms. And we're so thankful for this department. So uh, I know we'll call up uh, Dr. Kyle Rendon on behalf of the department to go out faster than we get. Recognizing students are West Slice of Teachers Association, otherwise known as WIDA for short. Um, for those that don't know, this is Teacher Appreciation Week, um, and we are just so thankful for our teachers. Uh, sent out a message earlier this week just to kind of talk about the importance of our teachers uh, in our district. I'm regularly amazed by the dedication of our teachers and the desire to do what is best for students every day. When visiting classrooms across the district, it's evident that this is a special place and we truly have the best educators around. Um, I still believe that teaching is the most important and rewarding, the most important and rewarding profession out there. Uh, teachers play a crucial role in the development and growth of individuals. They're responsible for imparting knowledge, skills, and values that shape our students' future. And overall, teachers are vital to the growth and development of our students, not just academically, but also socially and emotionally. And our West Side teachers help students become well-rounded individuals who are equipped to succeed in life. Uh, we appreciate all you do and thank you. And we have uh, Mr. Joe Dixon and Mr. Phil Kane here tonight to present our certificate to. but I have so many papers I can't have those, like, I felt like I was going to be dropping all over the place. Uh, so our fourth group for recognition tonight is our, our school nurses. Um, Wednesday this week, yesterday, was National School Nurse Day. Uh, this day is special to me personally as my mom was a school nurse uh, in Three Village School District for many years. Uh, I saw firsthand the amount of work that she put in each day uh, and outside of the school day to provide the best level of support for all the students in her building. And our West Islip nurses work tirelessly to ensure the health and well-being of our students, which really does contribute to their overall academic success. School nurses play an important role in promoting a safe and healthy environment for learning every day in our schools. Our West Islip school nurses are amazing, so make sure you thank a school nurse when you see them uh, here today. And uh, we're going to call on Ms. Sharon Kerrigan to collect that certificate for the school nurses. Certainly, last but not least, our fifth group being recognized tonight is our Teamsters Local 237 clerical unit. Um, I mean, if there is 
any group that we could point to, just like IT, that none of this is possible without, that's our clerical unit. Uh, anyone who has worked in our schools knows that they are just so vital to the success um, of our district functions and that really nothing is possible without our clerical staff. We're so thankful for them every day. Uh, I can say from my own experience that when I'm successful, uh, there's always thanks that needs to be given to my secretary, Maureen, who's here tonight. I mean, everything from behind the scenes, from uh, the plaque you see uh, created uh, that was presented to Mr. McGinnis, um, you know, she's behind that. Uh, the agenda that you see, you know, for board meetings, uh, she's behind that. So it's our clerical staff works behind the scenes to make sure that everything works and runs smoothly, and we're so thankful to them. Um, just a note, uh, who do you go to when you need something done and done well, sometimes at a moment's notice? Uh, that's the best description of what our clerical uh, experience on a day-in, day-out basis of like, okay, I really need something in four minutes, and uh, it needs to be X, Y, and Z, and they do it so well, um, and really are just responsive to our community, responsive to our staff, and ultimately uh, helping to ensure the success of our students as well. So thank you to our clerical unit for all you do. And I know that we have Luann Dunn and Ben Carenza who are here this evening uh, to collect that certificate.
Can I make a motion for the approval of items T1 and T2, regular substitute Victoria and Victoria Pagano is the science and John Guerrero, psychologist, resignation? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Just want to make a special note on T2. I uh, want to congratulate John Guerrero. John is going to be going to uh, Beth Page School District to be their assistant director of special education. And he's moving into the administrative world. Uh, he's done an excellent job here uh, supporting our students and staff in West Isla and at the high school um, specifically. So we wish John Guerrero the best in his new endeavor. Congratulations to him. And we'd just like to make a motion for the approval of the remaining items uh, in the first knowledge. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. Okay, we will uh, move into our curriculum update with uh, Mrs. Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Tussie. Good evening, everybody. On Tuesday, May 16th, we will once again be celebrating Celebrate Education here in West Islip. It will be taking place at the high school after the end of the school day. We will have a whole bunch of events up there showcasing the wonderful things taking place in the district, such as a district art show, live music performances, um, modeling by the robotics team in regard to all of their different creations, um, tours of the fitness center and the planetarium, and presentations by our virtual enterprise students, just to name a few. A schedule will be shared with the community on Monday that will include where the different events will be taking place and at what time. IB and AP testing is well underway up at the high school. Testing started on April 29th. It concludes on May 19th, which is next week. We have approximately 300 students participating in AP and IB exams uh, during that time period. That's a great number, and uh, we wish the best of luck to all of those students. Beach Street and Utah Road Middle School are celebrating Wellness Day on May 25th. It's a full day celebration dedicated to supporting the mental health and social emotional well-being of our students. Students will engage in mindfulness exercises as well as other engaging activities. A DJ and my favorite part, emotional support dogs, will be added to the festivities. So I will definitely be out there <laughs> hanging out with emotional support dogs. Fourth grade students today at Paul J. Baloo Elementary School traveled to Suffolk County uh, Police Headquarters out in Riverhead. They had an amazing trip. They were getting off the bus saying it was the best field trip ever. They visited the crime lab um, to see how evidence is collected and tested. They visited the museum um, and viewed police memorabilia, awards, and uniforms that had been worn over the decades. Um, they also visited an outdoor area where they witnessed a helicopter taking off and landing, canine dogs sniffing for explosives, and taking down fake perpetrators. Um, they also witnessed the jaws of life being used to help a mock victim, and uh, it concluded with a motorcycle parade. Uh, so great, great job with the Suffolk County Police Department today. And just last but not least, planning is underway for the 23-24 school year. We have had an amazing school year this year. We have made strides at every level, elementary school, middle school, high school, in all subject areas. Our students, our teachers, our administrative team, um, all of our staff members and support staff have really worked hard to get back to where we need to be after the pandemic. And now uh, we're looking forward to another great year next year. Thank you, Mr. Tessie. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Morrison. We'll uh, move into the report of board committees, starting with the Education Committee, Mr. Antonella. Okay, thanks, Mr. Tussie. The uh, Education Committee met Tuesday, May 9th at Beach. The meeting started at 725. In attendance was Superintendent uh, Romanelli, Assistant Superintendent John Morrison, Assistant Superintendent um, Ms. Pilati. Board members include myself, Ms. Debbie Brown, Mrs. Grace Kelly, Mr. Pete McCann, Mr. Anthony Tussie, and Mr. Ron McGinnis. The uh, first topic discussed was the uh, profile of the graduate. Uh, we're excited about this. This is something that Dr. Romanelli brought to us uh, when he first got here uh, to the board uh, about setting up um, a profile for a graduate and what uh, kind of qualities we want in our website of students by the time they graduate. Uh, the um, district is working with staff and students uh, and sharing shared survey with the community to determine what kinds of things we want in this profile of the graduate. The uh, second thing we discussed was the code of conduct and updates to the code of conduct and a trying to create 
uh, updates from K through 12, uh, create some similarities, uh, instituting different forms of, um, of discipline, uh, restorative style discipline, uh, the professional development on these things in the fall. We also discussed uh, MTSS uh, last year. Uh, we got a grant from uh, NYSED, the elementary school. Uh, we also discussed that uh, soon can you screening is coming up next month. And then this is an important note uh, from the kindergarten teachers uh, pointing to the positive developments of kindergarten students coming up from our own UPK program, which is great to hear. The uh, meeting ended at 7.50, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Antonella. We're moving to finance committee with Mr. McGinnis. Thank you. The committee met on May 9th. The members present, uh, Grace Kelly, Keelan McCann, and myself, other board members in attendance, Mr. Antonello and Debbie Brown. Uh, the administrators present, Dr. Romanelli, uh, Lisa Pilati, Assistant Superintendent for Business, and Don Morrison, Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction. The purpose of the meeting was to review the warrants for the month and discuss department fiscal matters. The meeting is called to order at 745. Following reports were presented and accepted by the committee. The treasurer's uh, report for school district and extracurricular funds for the month of March. The payroll summary, financial statements, and internal, internal claims for the report for the month of March. The system manager audit trail for the month of April. And the payroll certification for April 21st and May 2nd, 2023. Uh, the committee received the warrants for the month and we discussed and reviewed. Uh, the following board agenda finance items, uh, the budget transfers, approval of surplus from upright piano at Manitoc that's in poor condition, uh, approval of 2022-23 DOR, DOL contracts for Oyster Bay, East Norwich uh, School District and Smith County School District. Uh, approval of 22-23 health services contract for South Huntington for 36 students. Approval of bids for 23-24, for refrigeration and repair service, gates and chain link fencing, district newsletters, budget brochure, graduation newsletter, and adult education brochure, and other matters, and athletic uniforms, and building and ground uniforms. Uh, we were informed that R.S. Abrams, uh, the district's external auditors, will be doing some of their testing uh, in May, and the year end audit is scheduled to take place in August, uh, being adjourned at 7 Thank you, Mr. Nicholas. Uh, special Ed Committee, Ms. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Tuffy. The Special Education Committee met on May 10th at 8.30 via teleconference. In attendance were myself, Board Member Ron McGinnis, Administrators Dawn Morrison, Jean Dowling, and Gail Dougherty. We discussed CSC and CPSE IEPs that were to be approved. All the middle and high school reviews have now been completed. Mrs. Dowling informed us that our partnership with ESS, which stands for Effective School Solutions, has commenced. Effective School Solutions is an organization that provides inclusive mental health and behavioral support programs that improve care, strengthen outcomes, address trauma, and maintain students in their home district. It works off of a multi-tiered system of support framework. The licensed mental health counselor from ESS is now working in our high school. The counselor has met with numerous students and families and has thus far had a significant impact in the short time that we have been partnered with ESS. The Unified Basketball team has won the last three games and today at 4.30 played their last. And guess what? They won. <laughs> and next week, the team plays in North Babylon and that will determine if they go to the playoffs. meeting adjourned at 8.50 a.m. and the next committee meeting will be June 7th at 8.30 a.m. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mrs. Brown. Uh, we'll move into Health and Wellness with Mrs. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chessy. The Health and Wellness Alliance met on Tuesday, May 9th, 2023 at Paul J. Cole Elementary. Members present were Tim Moran, Rhonda Pratt, Deb Brown, Melanie Steinway, Ryan Stubbin, Diane Seppi, Lauren Amadis, Tara Howe, Julie Canestra, Mark Soto, Camille Newsom and Barbara Morris. They uh, we went over the financial report. Um, we also spoke about the Don't Press Send presentation that was at Paul J. Blue with the uh, fourth and fifth graders, and it received very positive feedback. And all the students and staff said it was very informative. Um, the Health and Wellness Senior Scholarship members reviewed over 100 anonymous applications, and two recipients were selected. Each will receive a $500 scholarship. Uh, we spoke 
a little bit more about the Halloween Hustle community event. Uh, the Alliance members will share sponsorship forms with local businesses in hopes that they will want to support a sponsored event. And the Hustle will have participants navigate through the Halloween theme station along the high school course. Costumes are encouraged, and the Alliance are exploring a student photographer for the after event. And then there will be a DJ, music, fun, treats, and um, you know, it'll be a great celebration for all of them. And a new and old business, we spoke a little bit about online gambling concerns and awareness. And they also had a slight revision to the Health and Wellness Alliance mission statement, replacing abuse with use and misuse. The next meeting is scheduled for September 19th, 2023 in the cafeteria at the Royal Laundry. Thank you, Mrs. Kelly. Uh, business items, Mrs. Body. Thank you, Mr. Tussie. May I have a motion to the approval of budget transfers 4290 through 4302 for the general fund and capital funds? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? <laughs> motion carries. May I have a motion for the approval of the bids listed on the agenda for the 2023-24 school year? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. May I have a motion for the approval of the 2022-23 contracts as listed on the agenda? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We have a motion for the approval of the surplus piano at Manitoc Elementary School. So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Kaladi. Uh, we're going to move into the President's report. Um, I do have uh, some additional discussion items I just want to mention. The 2023-24 uh, Board of Education uh, meeting and planning session dates and locations have been added to the notice. Uh, there will be no planning session in December, just one Board of Education meeting held on December 7th. The April Board of Education meeting date change was, uh, to April 16, 2024 was made to correspond with the East and Suffolk BOCES administrative election and budget vote. And this uh, discussion about, well, we have locations and meetings have also been added uh, to the item. I think it was the first thing they said. So, any questions or comments about those? Okay. I have a motion, please, then, to approve the BOCES multi year service agreement, 501 services. Uh, from 7 1 2023 to 6 30 2026. So moved. Second. Okay, can I have a motion of approval, please, for the Bridges Academy lease agreement and second amendment? So moved. Discussion? Oh, oh the yeah. 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 Discussion? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? <laughs> motion carries. I'm moving ahead. I right, still so need to read the uh, second one before you guys. That's a motion, please, and approval of the Bridges Academy lease agreement, the second amendment. Ready? <laughs> so, okay. Second. Okay. Second. Okay. Discussion? Yeah, so, so on, on this lease, so just so we're clear on um, the differential on the lease, and maybe Mrs. Claude can give us a call. So, difference in. The differences in the amendment to this, or maybe Dr. Rowan, maybe just to put it out there in terms of, so obviously Bridges Academy leases the Curdy, the old Catholic building, and uh, we had an amendment to their lease, which is favorable to the district. I just want to make that point. Yeah, so, um, you know, the way that our Bridges lease reads is that we have um, leased them a certain square footage, a number of classrooms within the building. Uh, they've expanded past the square footage noted in the lease uh, to have three additional classrooms. So we have basically a price per square foot in the building. So the amendment uh, really just reflects the additional usage in the building and bridges would pay the district for the usage of the additional square footage. It started uh, April 1st uh, of this year and we'll go through the remainder of the school year. Uh, our full lease does expire uh, with bridges as well at the end of the year, so we should expect to see a full lease agreement uh, and the upcoming agenda as well for the next um, next term. <coughs> All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. All right, before we move into the superintendent's report, uh, I just want to embarrass Dr. Romanelli for a second and would like to just publicly wish him a very happy birthday. <laughs> I'm 
this in there for no balloons. So yeah. maybe next year. Okay, that's where we have it. Ms. Morrison and Ms. Pilati uh, left out balloons in my office this morning, which was great. Um, I was very happy to start the day like that. Um, and thank you. I was trying to keep the secret that Ms. Morrison let the cat out of the bag uh, at our PTA meeting this evening. Um, so just a quick uh, update here. Uh, you know, um, I've been working as part of a plan pilot, um, which is a committee across New York State talking about performance-based assessments. Um, and really the idea behind this is that um, not all students demonstrate mastery of learning best through a standardized test or readings examination. Um, there are different uh, ways that students can demonstrate mastery of learning, such as learning portfolios, or really um, for anyone that attended the most likely to succeed uh, community film screening, we saw a showcase of learning where students created something. Um, we're, our philosophy really is um, rooted in the fact that uh, when you look at artificial intelligence as really surpassing us for recall of information, as you see with ChatGPT or Alexa or just being on your phone and using Google, um, we know that the information isn't always 100% correct, uh, but we do know that our students need to be uh, applying what they've learned in school and really being able to demonstrate their mastery in that way, rather than just regurgitating information for a test and then moving on and not necessarily retaining the information. Uh, so we want uh, to create a system that involves real learning, uh, where students are able to apply what they've learned in school. Um, that is really what I know Mr. Antonello gave an update on the Education Committee and talked about the profile of the graduate. Uh, that's the work that we've been doing um, all year this year. You know, we've had a uh, book talk on the book, What's Supposed to Be, our entire administrative uh, unit read the book and had discussions at our admin council meetings. Uh, teachers across the district as well have read the book and met with uh, Mrs. Morrison and myself to discuss the uh, book. We had our community film event for Most Likely to Succeed. Uh, and we gave out a survey. Uh, we received over a thousand responses for our survey in terms of the West Side of Profile Graduate and identified six areas uh, that we believe are the skills, knowledge, habits, and attitudes our students need to be successful uh, after high school in West Islip. Uh, so, you know, one, I've shared the story with a few people already, but uh, Mrs. Morrison, Dr. Kylie Rendon, and myself were able to go to uh, Ms. Kristen Tello's uh, art class at the high school and present uh, our findings and the results of the survey to the students in that class who were then able to work on creating a visual representation of our West Side Slip Profile graduate. So we are excited to be sharing with the community uh, in June. We'll do a presentation for the Board of Education, um, if that's acceptable, uh, and just share like what the results were, what the visual representation is gonna be. The students were very excited about uh, creating a visual representation, which we thought was wonderful. Um, so we'll be sharing that with everyone. That will really serve as a North Star for us about what goes on in our classroom, the teaching and learning that takes place, the programs that we bring in the district, you know, are we meeting the needs of our students and our families uh, to help develop those traits? So we're very excited about that work and we'll give a full presentation uh, in June if that uh, works with the Board of Education. Very much looking forward to that. Great. Um, and just finally, uh, just along those lines, you know, I just wanted to commend uh, Mr. Bolmuth uh, for, at the high school, Mr. Ryan Bolmuth, he's our transition coordinator, uh, one of our teachers up there who organized a career fair uh, in combination with the West Side of Chamber of Commerce and the West Side of Fire Department that hosted the event. Uh, it was great to see our students there. Uh, many were, we bust over a number of students from the high school. Uh, some students were looking for jobs for after graduation. Other students were looking for summer jobs. Uh, I saw a few internships uh, arranged, you know, so I know that the West Side of Fire Department had three internships for over the summer uh, that some students were potentially matched up with. So uh, great to see our students, um, you know, using their skills in person, looking for employment opportunities, looking for internships, and even just networking and having conversations with people in local businesses um, and beyond to really try to uh, expand and set themselves up for success uh, outside of the school day. So, great event, and thank you, Mr. Ball, for that. Also, just one final thing, thank you to Mr. Bossi uh, for arranging our solar presentation tonight. Uh, we appreciate all the work that you did on that, and uh, thanks so much for being here. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Romero. Uh, before we move into the uh, public session, uh, I just have an announcement I'd like to make. Uh, I'd like to thank the West Isop Chamber of Commerce, uh, along with the American Legion, uh, West Isop Schools, and other local community groups. Uh, they will be hosting the Tom Compatello Memorial Barbecue, the first annual Tom Compatello Memorial Barbecue, immediately following uh, our Memorial Day Parade. Um, it is free for all parade participants and their families. 
everyone is encouraged to come down. It's hopefully going to be a, a great event, and obviously in the name of a very special man who is near and dear to all of us. So if you're at the parade, come on down. It's at, located at the shack behind Paul J. Bloom. Everyone is welcome. There'll be Italian ices, hamburgers, hot dogs, pretzels, and other refreshments. I'm looking forward to having a, a great day in a fantastic, amazing man's honor. Okay, and at this time, uh, we will call up our first uh, speaker. We have Maureen Pike. My name is Maureen Pike and I'm a paraprofessional at Paul J. Blue in the special education classroom and I love my job. The best way to describe my job is I'm a mom for school. I do everything a mom would do just at school. I give hugs when they're sad, I wipe away tears when they get hurt, I cheer the loudest for their achievements no matter how big or small. I wipe noses, I tie shoes, I make sure they're always included. I tell them it's okay to make mistakes. If they have an accident, I clean them up. I'm there to help them find the words when they cannot find them for themselves. Some days are hard, like really hard, but I continue coming back every day because it's what I signed up for. It's what I love to do, and it makes me fulfilled. I also have two children within the school district in elementary school, and I ask them about their aids. I want to get their perspective. Did you know that my daughter's lunch aid plays with her and her friends at recess? My daughter tells me how fun she is, how she loves her. I know these women are teaching my children. They're teaching, them ch they're teaching them to be independent, to be good friends, to be kind, to get through conflicts, but they're also showing them love. If they get hurt at recess or just having a bad day, my children are being loved, and for that, I am so very grateful. I'm grateful for the kindness and compassion they give my children on a daily basis, and I know these paraprofessionals deserve more. Paraprofessionals do more than most parents will ever know. We make it possible. If teachers are the backbone of the school, then parents are the heart, and we deserve more. I saw a quote by Rita Pearson, who was an educator turned public speaker. She said, every child deserves a champion, an adult who will never give up on them, who understands the power of connection, and insists they become the best they can possibly be. This is what I work hard at each day for these children, because I love my job. But I deserve more. Thanks for your time. involved in education for 23 years, I, I know all too well how much the paraprofessionals mean uh, to us as teachers and of course as, as parents and how much the kids get out of it. So I thank you and I thank everyone that you work with, uh, both past and present, uh, and I really have to say I just commend you all for the job that you guys do because sometimes it really does go unnoticed, so thank you. Okay, uh, card number two belongs to Dory Mitchell. Everybody, happy birthday. So last month I spoke about DEI and kind of more time. I'd like to hold out and try to make it short this time. I sent the letter, I'm sure you got the letter, I assume. Um, so I just want to clear up a few things that, that were said, both sides. So you don't know about DEI, there's no surprise there, obviously. And there are very good reasons, and I never have time to explain to you why, where it comes from, the analogy behind it. You know, it's just too much to talk about. I think I'm not just start saying things, just that I, the knowledge I have about it. I know you guys love children, there's no doubt in your mind. I think it's more so for a long time, I know she um, totally loves children. So when I come up here, I'm not looking to stir the pot or be the We all have our roles to advocate for children. And, um, Dr. Malley, I'm not sure if you know where I'm at at this point, but my children graduated, the last one graduated last year. So in the um, equity committee, I'm not, I was not there, and I appreciate the fact that you opened it up to some of your parents, I think that's great. My point was is that I did not know about um, how, the, how the meetings were run, and I did not, I think what this information in, in our society, our culture, is a strong work, and I do not think that I was, providing any misinformation and I'm not looking to get the community going in any sense of the word in a way. And I want to clear the record with that. 
because um, I try to get my back straight when I speak, and I speak in my heart because I've been educating myself. I've been for a very long time, I'm a man with three sons. So what I was getting at with this, the point I was making is that the meeting was, has, the meeting was run by the administration, is the minutes were put out by the administration, and I was citing specific examples. I wasn't there because I'm not a parent, and the meetings were only open to parents, not residents. That's why I asked if you could record them, because it is a very controversial topic, and I understand the things you the examples you gave are fine examples, and we'll talk about that for a minute, but if, if you look at the umbrella of DEI and where it comes from, for me personally, you know, my feelings, it's a dangerous thing. It's not a good thing. And, you know, sometimes when I get cut off, and, I, and again, you have to cut me off, I get that. But um, when I said about races, I want to be very clear that I love all races. I don't care what color it is, okay? I might have different ideology and beliefs and belief systems, but I always will protect every single child that who they are. But it doesn't mean that children who have opposing views in English class, for instance, or in health class, they should be able to speak their mind. But there's things put in place that children are silenced, and they're not mature enough to know that they have a voice that should be heard. And that's the problem that I have that is a political issue, okay? And when I said schools are political, it's neither good or bad. They just really just are political, because that's just the way they are, because of the way the mandates come from the state. So, I do ask that you think about it, talk about it amongst yourselves, try to have those meetings available for the public because I spoke, um, we spoke, it was 200 people who wanted to be on the committee, not 400. Okay, so I over exaggerated that one. Um, but there were 200 people who were very passionate about it, very concerned. As far as race, um, like I said, you know, it goes to two extremes. Like, school districts have a history across the board of the hiring from the men. Um, and that's not a bad thing. That could be a good thing, it could be a bad thing, okay? So, um, I got a district, you know, maybe, be, you know, my friends' districts. A lot of people hire from within, or people they know, and a lot of companies doing the nepotism, whatever. And now we're going to, like, full-on diversity. My feeling, where I'm coming from, the DEI problem I have, is it sets up a system of oppressors and victims, where we make some people feel like a victim, but they're not important enough, they can't do things on their own, they need people to help them so much, it makes them feel belittled. That was my point. Whereas, and then the other people feel like they're doing the damage and should feel guilty and shame, okay? So my point is, the person who should get a job is the person with the best credentials, the best skills, and the person who can interact the best with children, be a people person. You can be a smart person, but not adapt well to children. So I want to clear that up. As far as best special education, so please think about recording the meetings, just so everybody understands. And I'm always about the truth, whether people like the truth or not. The truth is the truth. There's only one truth. Okay, and that's my point. And we don't have to agree. It's just, that's to me what transparency is. Let people know, and this way they don't have to wonder. Okay? The other thing is, special education was given as an example. I've been a special, ad, a special advocate for my whole life, practically, as an adult. And, um, Special education is near and dear to me because I have my own son advocate for who had a learning disability and I have a whole history here. So when I when you mention special ed, it kind of like I don't want to come across like I'm being cold. When I said equity in general, principle of equity, okay, if you really know it well and the history where it comes from, it has to come from something. Okay, you, you saw my letter, I'm not happy that they took the weighted averages away from students in the honors level. And I'm, I had a child with a disability. And I told my children that they are going to be kids smarter than me, and that's just like it doesn't mean they're precious and smart. And I feel so bad for those I just, I'm going to interrupt you. I'd give you six minutes, so if I could just ask you to make that last point. And everything you're saying is duly noted, and I, and I do appreciate what, what you're saying. Okay, and we, uh, hopefully we can get some of the people besides me to change that rule, because the three minutes is just it's too stressful, it's not fair. It's at it's six, so. I know, I appreciate that. Okay, so as far as special ed, give me one more, one more minute, please. <laughs> Um, special ed by the nature of special is oriental, just so we know. We have IDA. A lot of times in education, parents do not know their rights. We already, they already are entitled to services if they qualify for them. And a lot of times, parents don't know that they can bring their own children up for child study. A lot of times, kids get lost in the cracks because they don't know. They can go to the teacher and say, yeah, I want my child tested. They don't know it. So we have provisions in place for special education children. And I just do have a couple more questions. And these are questions, okay? No more statements, narratives. Um, I'd like to know what the headings of the subcommittees are. 
you said you have different head of like different subcommittees, maybe you don't know them yet, but maybe in the future we can you can tell the community what I know the main committee and the subcommittees. So I think the community should know what the subcommittees are, what the curriculum, what the social, what the emotional, just so we can get an idea. Um, the other question I had was um, the DA discipline. Okay, so moving into an, an area where I'm gonna just to answer that question. Thank you, please. Why, if, if, does anybody know, I, I just have a question for you. If the meeting goes tonight, what is the difference between the We follow all the rules and orders as we have since okay. the beginning of this time, and, and mm -hmm. we only get to we get that You're at eight minutes now, so. Okay, how are we doing? We're more than flexible every time you speak, okay. and we're really trying to let you get through, so I'm asking if you could just cut right to it and ask that question. Okay, so how would you change the rules? For instance, the time first, and then the big part, I think you said, Mr. Tessie, that you're, you're going in multiple different directions here. So I'm not going to ask the question about changing the rules in the cards. If you have a question you want to ask us, ask it. Otherwise, I'm going to ask you to sit down. Okay, so my first question is, how do we go about changing the rules to give people more time to talk? Because I think it is disrespectful. I don't have the answer to that at the moment, but we can discuss it. Okay, a petition. I can start a petition. And the other last question is, forever, since I've been in this district, my oldest son is almost 32. People can order pink cards any time of the meeting. You say numerous times that you have to have your card filled out at the beginning of the meeting we can speak. Is that true? Is that how you change it? Last year we, we made that. You never made that public. Yeah, that we, did, we did make that public. You made it public. We said by multiple time. times when we were having three hour meetings last year. That's because of COVID. That's because if of that's what you think, that's fine. This this time I'm going to thank you for your time up here and I'm going to call on our next person. Sure. Thank you. We have to make some changes. Thank you. I just have uh, one brief comment and one, uh, I guess, uh, I guess statement I'd like to make. First, I congratulate Dr. O'Malley on what I believe to be a very successful first year. My wife and I are long-time public school teachers and have been with this community since the early 1990s. I've met with these superintendents and my quality of the best one so far that we've dealt with them most nicely. Really you met many of our colleagues, our professional colleagues that work here throughout the districts, and I've heard many positive things about the culture being able to change, so I want to applaud you for that. I just want to take a moment really quickly, and I may be a little in the dark on this, but I understand that there's a proposal maybe to touch on a little bit in the new pool. I'm a long-time swimming coach, uh, not to give you my resume, but I've been uh, involved in the United States swimming since 1980s. I'm a certified swimming coach in the American Swimming Coach Association, sectional swimming coach, and coach at Lindenhurst uh, High School for the last 30 years. Um, I know a little bit about swimming pools, and also with the American Red Cross. I just want to put it out there that if you're in the proposal stage and looking to rebuild the pool, which I think is a fantastic thing, I would like you to really sincerely uh, consider uh, deck space. Um, if I can give you an example, Brentwood High School in the 80s basically used their pool as a, as a dumpster. They rebuilt it in the 90s and they shrunk the deck space to where the pool is a beautiful facility but it is unusable in terms of the need. If you look at, uh, for example, Farming and High School, they squish a huge pool, did a beautiful job, they can actually run swimming meets. Uh, when you look at the pool structure, we talk about all the high school athletics in, in this particular, but if you have a pool that has uh, adequate deck space, you know we're going to pull to the United States swimming, you can host sanctioned events, and you could be an income generator here. So I know this is a big financial uh, improvement that the district's taking on. It's a big budget item, and I really want the district to be short-sighted, and I know a lot of architects out there are convinced districts. I've been on planning committees uh, in the summer with the pools that I've run in the past, and one of the things, oh, you can cut down the deck space. That's the first thing the architects always say. You can save yourself lots of money, and that's true, but in the long run, we might be actually hurting the rest nicely. So I just want you to consider that. I would gladly volunteer my time if you have any people from the outside looking into this. This is something I'm very passionate about. I mean, I've been swimming for a very long period of time, and I think it would benefit the district in the long run if you take it seriously. So that was my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to follow up on the art guards topic real quick. 
Um, thank you for giving a detailed response to last meeting's discussion. You definitely gave some new detail and insight and definitely appreciate that. Um, I do have three questions. Um, first, would you consider giving a parent's guide for young elementary age kids on the difference in the drills? Um, my boys are first and second grade. Um, I've asked them a few times, like, what do you do if a bad guy comes in the building? And their responses are varied. And it doesn't always seem like they know what to do. Um, I will say that my kids both have learning delays, so the responsibility they're just not getting it. But that also frightens me because I don't know if they're going to be safe if God something were to happen. Can you for a second? Yeah. So I just don't know what you're talking about. You're like a pamphlet that goes home. Just something. Out. Yeah, yeah, just some, I don't know. Lockdown, lock in, so forth. Yeah, like what it is, and just so I can use the same language because the way I might describe something may not be the way that the school is reiterating it to the kids, and I don't want to confuse them because they need short, short, deep, like, no details, like, short steps, do this, this, and this, like, and done. I just wanted to make sure that we're all kind of on the same page as parents and what they're teaching in school. Um, secondly, can you share the data that you're collecting with bullet points for the community? Um, just so that there's a clear understanding of what the costs are, uh, what the impact would be, and things like that. I know that uh, there's a budget coming up and how it would impact the budget if it were impl imposed whatever you want to add it uh, for September. Um, and I know that you're a new captain here, and you're doing a great job uh, responding to community concerns. Um, previously, though, we had talked about air conditioning for like three years, and I just want to make sure that we're not kind of moving in that direction. Um, is there any kind of a timeline as far as when there will be a decision made with our guards, whether it's July, September? Just something that we're not constantly pushing the bar back in each meeting saying, because we did that for three years with air conditioning, and thank God it's it not like a <laughs> <laughs> it took, But it took a while, because finally like, it was decided on, and then the town had to vote on it, and then it had to get adopted, and then now finally they're going to get solved this summer, which is great, but are we looking at like two years? Are we looking at you know just some sort of time frame? I guess. And you know, they don't want it to be a rushed decision, obviously. Yeah, I think the consistent answer that we've been giving is it's really not fair to put a time frame on it because it yeah. kind of holds us back. But I think most of us would want the decision sooner than later. And I don't, I don't want to speak on behalf of anyone else. If you disagree with that, please let me know. But I, it's we want to make this quickly. Yeah, yeah. when you're right comfortable. I mean, yeah. Could I also just add that, um, you know, I know one thing that the Board of Education has asked our team to do is really keep this at the forefront. You know, the community has asked, you know, not to drop the topic, so we've kept it in our announcement section on the board agendas and we'll keep reporting on it. Okay. I think a decision needs to come when there's, I mean, you can hopefully see that, you know, we're presenting new information, you know, we're doing more research on this and presenting findings. When it gets to the point that there's no more findings being presented, right. you know, it's kind of time to make a decision at that point and come naturally, so. Okay. Yeah, I was just, just questioning it because like, they just didn't want like, a search party going out forever, getting collecting data, and then, you know, here we are three years later. <laughs> sure, noted. Um, and this has nothing to do with security, but um, is there a way that we can start, I, I've asked this before a, a couple different ways, but just reporting the parent academies and the presentations that are given to the district because I have a full-time job, my husband is only at home seven days a month, and my kids are in three different sports a season. So I am crazy busy all the time, and just trying to make it to these things can be really, really difficult, or I have to get a babysitter, or something like that. And I find that it's kind of frustrating that if I can't be there, then I miss the whole thing, you know? So I don't know if there's a way that we record these meetings, is that something that could be reported also in the set of community? Yeah, we could certainly consider that. Um, you know, I know that uh, we've been already talking about, you know, additional parent academies that we'd like to host, so uh, we'll certainly consider that in the future. And um, definitely really appreciate your idea about parents' guide for difference in the drills. You know, I think that's really important. I have three school-age children of my own. I have those conversations with them as well, and it's, you know, uh, I think the common language is really, really important. So yeah. I mean, like, I've asked my kids what, what happens if there's an emergency, like, in our house, and it, their answers are wild. I mean, like, right. you know, right. one of them's like, I'm going to go get a hose outside, and the other one's like, I'm going to run down the street to the neighbor, and I'm like, which neighbor? He's like, you know, the guy with the hair. And I'm like, <laughs> right, man, like, what are you doing? But, like, that's, okay, if God forbid there was a fire in my house, but that's not, like, this is way more important, so I just want to. 
For sure, yeah, we can probably within a, you know, a friendly, community friendly way of our, we do have, you know, emergency response plans for all of our buildings and for our district. None of them involve uh, running through the back there. <laughs> <laughs> we can put that into some, some friendly yeah. Alright, thank you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you. 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 Thank you.